What are we calling this? Uh, Murph special. Murph special. I like that. Oh, I Murph off season special. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's do that. Right okay. Uh, you guys got your recordings going? Yes. Yes. All right. Off season Murph special. <laughs> Kids are going to be impressed. All right. Okay. Uh, you guys all ready here? I got my recording going. Yep. You want me to count you in, Kevin? Yeah, let's do it. All right. You too, Murph. Okay. okay. In five, four, three, two, Chiefs to the Super Bowl, one, clap. Oh, that felt dirty. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to a special edition, another special edition of the NFL End Zone here on the Fandom Podcast Network. Now, we recently did an off-season special, both Kyle and I, but you know what? We had an opportunity to talk to someone else that we've had on the show before, and uh, we've also had him uh, on a recent recording of the Hair Metal Podcast here on the Fandom Podcast Network. And so we're going to call this the End Zone Off-Season Murph Special. Uh, now, we were going to hopefully not have any chief influence because uh, my co-host Kyle was going to, I guess he lost some power or maybe he was just afraid to come on. So Kyle, what, what happened? Um, you know, my maintenance man came over, he got into the main fuse box and surprisingly enough, there was a Chucky doll in a Raiders outfit messing with my power, which just leads me to think like the Raiders themselves, Raider fans are scared to have any face off time with the chiefs fan. So <laughs> that is not true. And I have some <laughs> backup with me from Raider fans ra radio. We have our wonderful guest back Murph. Welcome Murph. I told you to cut both the lines. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait. This is typical Raider fan. Can't handle everything by themselves. Has to cheat. That's been going on since. Hey, you think we got this reputation on, uh, on falsities? If you ain't, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. That's right. That line used to be posted in the locker room. Of course we're going to cheat. I'm gonna water Come on. Football, I'll water down the field, put helium in the football, and I'm going to write dirty names all over it, too. Oh, come on. We're just, just, just know we're not a bunch of Frady Cats like Ahmad Rashad was back in the day when he talked about three. <laughs> oh, that's true. Well, you're going to be Frady Cat fishing with the four wins you're going to rip out. Uh-huh. Yeah, I digress. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm glad to be back. Uh, it's been what's a bit, uh, feels like it's been a year or maybe not quite that long, but since I joined you guys here on the end zone and had, had a great time. And uh, so, yeah, look forward to, to this and, and thanks for having me on the hair metal podcast. You, I feel like an honorary member of the fandom podcast network today, man. You <laughs> are my friend. You are. And appreciated. We uh, had some fun talking about eighties hair metal, uh, but we're, in, we're here to have you talk about some football. And of course we're going to talk a little bit of Raiders a little bit later, but uh, Kyle and I, of course, like to cover uh, the NFL in general and what's happening. OTAs are going on. And a lot of stories are going to – you know, when you watch ESPN or NFL, they're kind of trying to milk everything to try and make anything interesting. They're on a luck watch right now, whether or not luck is throwing with a regulation football or, a, you know, a small baby football, <laughs> whatever it is that you want to call it. <laughs> Uh, got maybe the nerf ball. Ball, nerf ball he's playing with right now. <laughs> Wait, is that spiral nerf that throw that always throws really well? Oh, Could that be it? It. Especially <laughs> the whistle tail on the back. <laughs> yeah. So Mur Murph, uh, before we get into uh, the Raiders and such, uh, Kyle and I want to touch on some uh, some you know basic NFL news. And, and the one thing that just came out right now was uh, this thing with Reggie Bush. Jury orders Rams to pay Reggie Bush $12.5 million for his injury. Uh, a jury in St. Louis on Tuesday ordered the NFL Rams to pay former running back Reggie Bush $12.5 million for a severe knee injury he suffered in 2015 in the team's final season in St. Louis before moving to Los Angeles. If you guys remember, the old St. Louis Rams had this concrete, uh, I guess, track that went around right next to the stands uh, where the fans were sitting and when you were on that with cleats no matter what cleats you were on it was like walking on ice Kyle you remember this 
Oh, yeah. You know, and I got I to throw this out real quick with this ruling, Kevin. I know Murph will probably agree with me. This should open up a bunch of old class action seats for players who played at the old veteran stadium that the Eagles played at. <laughs> yes, I know, right? <laughs> Murph, oh, what was that one? There was a one wide receiver for the Bears. I forget his name. but I know David. Yes, came down and didn't he like tear both of his patella tendons and like like snap both of his kneecaps literally on that? Yeah, yeah, it was awful. It's an awful, awful injury. What was your take on the Reggie Bush thing when you first heard about this? Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, Murph, was, this is you, Murph. Yeah. This is you, Murph. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I remember it vaguely. It was uh, it was when he was with the Niners, and I just remember how kind of ugly looking it was how awkward he when he when he hit that concrete it kind of like his 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 foot kind of snapped out in front of him and he fell back on his rump and kind of slid into the wall there and tore his acl right like and that was pretty much the end of his career so reggie bush was already kind of on the tail end of his career and then you give a guy an acl and that pretty much uh pretty much was it so like no surprise there that it's a what 12 million dollars or something that he's gonna get yeah yeah it's it's crazy um we touched on luck I'm getting tired of the luck watch, luck watch personally. <laughs> he says he's going to be ready by week one. Uh, Kyle, do you believe him? Honestly, until I see him play in a preseason game, and he's got to play in at least one, how long it's been. But here's the other thing. I, I don't think the Colts are in that bad of shape cause with their backup. I thought he played pretty well for them last year, uh, Jacoby Brissett. He just didn't have talent around them. Yeah. What about you, Murph? What do you think? Are you, are you, do you believe he's going to be ready week one or do you want to, are you kind of like, prove it to me? <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of funky. Like, you know, the, what all the Colts went, remember how iffy it was with Peyton? And now like, it's almost like they're in the same thing, different injury, obviously, but they're like back in the same boat uh, with luck. You know, I don't know, man. I, 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 I hope the guy comes back. Cause I, I mean, you want to see, Obviously, you never want to see players go down and have their careers cut short or, or compromised by injury. But, man, that division is going to be just brutal. Like, I mean, if they don't have Andrew Luck, when you look at what the Titans, Texans, uh, and, and, and Jaguars are and what those other two teams have done already in the offseason, my gosh, man, that's just – the Colts are going to be in for a long season if they don't get Andrew Luck back. And it's a race, and it's funny because then you look at him, and it's like a race to see who's going to get the bigger biceps between him and Amari Cooper. It's like, holy cow. <laughs> yes, I know. Everybody's freaking hitting max day or they're apparently on the offseason. Like, well, no, wait, I, got, I got a question about that too. Are Amari Cooper's biceps so big that he can't actually even pull his arms into his body at this point? No, I, mean, like, I mean, hey, look, all the he drops. problem was catching last year. Yeah. <laughs> you guys remember David Boston, the big old wide receiver for the uh, mm-hmm. Chargers? He got big old. He was like yoked, man. It was like holy cow, guy was you. And all of a sudden, he couldn't catch anymore. Now look, I, I hopefully that's not what's going on with Cooper. And these guys will lean out as we get into the season. But but yeah, that picture that I saw the other day of Andrew Luck, I'm like holy cow, like mix in a leg day once in a while. Kyle, one of the things I wanted to talk about with you and Murph uh, is the OTAs that are going on and who's not showing up at the the mandatory mini camps, and who is. Uh, Odell Beckham showed up. But, of course, Max not shown up. Uh, I don't think Aaron Donald hasn't showed up. Le'Veon Bell hasn't showed up. These are all guys in their contract. Now, you had made an uh, interesting remark, I think, last time. You said that Aaron Donald and Max agents are probably trying to figure out who gets signed first, and then the other one's going to try to want more money. Uh, elaborate on that. Well, I, they're the best two defensive players in the NFL right now, with, and it's really not even close. Um, basically whoever signs first is going to set that bar and the other one's going to say, Hey, wait a minute. And at least if not match, try to exceed that contract a little bit. I mean, it's, it's a game of chicken of who's going to sign first. I think, I personally think it's going to be Aaron Donald because he is a year ahead of Mac, I believe. So there's a little bit more of a franchise tag issue with him. I think the the Raiders have been preparing to have to sign, knowing they have to sign Mac. Their 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 biggest issue, and they're going to have if the Rams have a similar issue, is salary cap space. The Raiders have cleared a, a lot, but Mac's going to eat up a ton of that. And you add in the contract they gave Carr, they've got some work to do. And the and the Rams went all in this year, and they're going to have a lot of big names that are going to become free agents at the end of this year. That they guys like um, Talib, who's on the last year of his deal, Marcus Peters is on the last year of his deal. They signed a Dominic and Sue to a one year deal. The Rams are going all in this this year, so I think it's more important they get Aaron Donald signed now than. I think they're, it's it's less pressure on the Raiders to get Max signed right now compared to the Rams for getting Donald signed. Murph, I want to have you elaborate on that too. And and 
you may know more about this than I do, and this is why I want to ask you, was if I remember correctly, Carr's contract, when he went to sign that, he made it to a certain degree flexible knowing, knowing that he wants to get these other players signed so that they can, can restructure it or, or whatever they need to do. What is your take on that and Mac holding out uh, of these mini camps, sending a message? Yeah. So uh, for the Derek Carr part, absolutely. He, he, the way that it, the contract was set up originally was very flexible. It was very team friendly and he was, pretty adamant about that, that he wanted to, uh, to be a Raider for life and he wanted to open it up, you know, so that the Raiders could accommodate all the other players that, that uh, they were going to need to in order for them to continue to be uh, competitive going forward. As you know, that, you know, we had, we had Gabe Jackson, which was, was with, uh, a big one. Uh, we got Amari Cooper's going to come up we're right in the middle of Khalil Mack. Like there's a, there's a lot of contracts that the Raiders needed to get done and the car contract was kind of the first domino now so with it being done last year and with its flexibility they can redo it again and they can the way with the way that they can uh, restructure it they can free up like 10 million bucks so kyle's right the raiders as they stand today have like five million bucks or some would say even less it's hard to tell salary cap stuff is like i mean it's to try to know what the actual exact figure is is pretty tough, but um, you can kind of get an idea. And so the, roughly the Raiders have between say two and a half and $5 million in cap space. Well, they can instantly free up another 10 million bucks uh, by restructuring uh, uh, Derek Carr. So when that happens, then it opens up for, for lots of opportunity uh, for them to get Mac done. Now I, um, I think you know, is there a game being played between Aaron Donald and, and Khalil Mack? I'm not sure. Um, I think one way or the other, though, the Raiders, like Kyle said, are not in a hurry. Um, the, you know, Derek Carr didn't sign his big deal until June. So I don't think that the Raiders are um, one in a hurry to do it. And I don't think Khalil Mack, yes, he's holding out and he probably should because I think I would too. Um, but he's holding out for a completely different reason versus like what some other players would, like even some former Raiders or current Raiders, but former contracts like what Donald Penn did, where he was trying to leverage past performance to a new deal, even though he already had an existing deal in place. Khalil Mack's not going to have a deal in place. So he's kind of, you know, staying at the house uh, until he gets one. And the Raiders aren't worried about him not being in shape. This is the kind of guy that has, you know, one of the best work ethics there is. And as Kyle said, is arguably one of the best defensive players in the league. So it's not like you got to worry about him showing up to camp, you know, overweight. And you know what I mean? Like the Raiders aren't worried about that. So I think the Mac deal is going to get done. It's going to get done soon. Um, one other player to throw out, not Raider related, but uh, we had discussed is Julio Jones out mm -hmm. of that that could be a big okay. one. Right? You're there in Atlanta, uh, Kevin. Yep. That's, I would assume that's been a hot topic, and that's a, you know, outside of you know, there was Beckham and it was uh, Mac, and then Aaron Donald and Julio, right? Like those were the big names this year that were looking to uh, at holdouts and needing big contracts. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a good a good example there because uh, in this uh, article here, it says if you're Beckham, for example, and you're currently scheduled to earn $8.5 million this year on your fifth-year rookie contract option, do you show up and risk an injury that could jeopardize like a $35 million or so guaranteed money that comes with top wide receiver contract these days? You know, and the, what I want, Kyle, I want you to, to elaborate on here is what's happening with Le'Veon Bell. You know, he's getting two franchise tags here. Uh, but he hasn't signed, I guess, the, the contract right now, so he's technically not on the roster. Enlighten me on this. Okay. He's franchised, so he can't go anywhere. And he, his average will be the top – he'll make the average of the top five players at his position with that franchise tag. The problem is what Le'Veon Bell wants is he wants to be paid not only what, to what he thinks his equal value is as not only the top running back in the league, but as one of the top receivers in the league. So he thinks he should be getting double duty. And th this is where the Steelers are like, no, you've got to be kidding me. The Steelers have actually put some fairly fair and legitimate offers out there for Le'Veon Bell, but I don't think this is going to end well. I think you're going to see Le'Veon Bell play out this year with the Steelers and he's going to go to another team. But to, I want to talk, go back to the Julio Jones thing. And here's the difference with like Julio Jones compared to some of these other players. Julio Jones has gone on record saying, I have no beef with the Falcons. I'm just trying to get a point across. Julio Jones still has three years left on his current mm -hmm. contract. Yeah. But, however, because the wide receiver contracts got yeah. so insane this offseason when you think about what Mike Evans got down here in Tampa, what Kansas City paid Sammy Watkins, which is completely based off 
possible potential there, what a couple other guys have gotten. And come on, does Julio Jones really need OTAs? The guy's a kind of a, always been a little bit banged up. He, he's a veteran in the league. He keeps himself in good shape. Why take the abuse on his body when he and keep himself fresh for when training camp starts? So I, I think this is just a smart move by Julio Jones. Same goes also for Earl Thomas up in C- Seattle. He's looking to get a big payday. He's holding out. Again, he's 29. We, a lot of people thought he was gone anyway because he of the whole Dallas thing at the end of last season. I don't blame him for holding out wanting a new contract considering how safeties are getting paid right now as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was a note saying that, uh, that Pete Carroll was not happy about this and was disappointed. <laughs> hey, can I ask a, a quick Kyle, who was it that uh, tried to get themselves labeled as a wide receiver, but what was it? Jimmy Graham that did that? Yeah. Yes. Jimmy Graham. It would, yeah. And that didn't work, did it? Like I don't, he didn't get a wide receiver contract. So do you think it's going to work for Bell? I th- no, I don't. I think Le'Veon Bell is going to price himself out of the league. It's going to yeah. take uh, he or, or or what's going to happen is he's going to end up with like a team that one of the few teams that's going to have a ton of salary cap room next season. So in other words, he'll probably be playing for the Cleveland Browns. So is he playing for a contract this year? Then I mean, is he trying to get out of Pittsburgh? You're thinking. He just wants to get paid. He's basically the he's basically in a Kirk Cousins situation. Right. Where Washington just kept franchising, tagging him, franchise tagging him, franchise tagging him. Nobody has ever Kirk Cousins is the only player in NFL history to be franchise tagged two, three straight years. They're not going to do Pittsburgh's not going to do it with Le'Veon Bell. I think they're getting a little tired of his act. And you got to think Pittsburgh is getting close to transition time. Ben, Big Ben is up there in age. Yeah, these quarterbacks are playing longer. Antonio Brown's on the wrong side of 30 now. Um, they, and they have some young players in place. Le'Veon, and they, they're really high on James Conner, the kid they drafted out of Pitt last year, who, of course, was uh, pretty well known because he also came, fought and recovered from cancer. So, and they're very high on him. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens in Pittsburgh this year. And we look at running backs in the NFL anymore. It's about a four or five year career and you're done. Yeah. Yeah. It's with very, with a few exceptions. All right. So since we've got you here, Kyle, you know, and uh, we, we thought we were going to have a, a, a chief's free zone there for a second, but that's not what happened. But I, <laughs> that's right Murph yell it out I thought that uh we would have a little fun here a little divisional fun here I was gonna ask Murph and so since you're here uh and el- the electricity gods have uh, granted you <laughs> <laughs> granted you access here I want to actually touch on our division here okay okay so the and AFC I, West. the AFC West okay and you have a nickname for it though don't you yeah oh yeah the incest division Yes. <laughs> Once you're in the division, you may never leave. <laughs> uh, I want to I touch on uh, the upcoming schedule here and uh, the, the Raiders-Chiefs rivalry. Uh, Raiders haven't fared very well. We did win a great game last year against you guys, but we obviously didn't win uh, the games that mattered. Uh, and um, I want to start with you, Merv. In addition to the Chiefs, if, if they do, what – other team in the division do you think is the is is the big threat for the Raiders getting into the playoffs uh I think it's the Chargers uh, f- first off on that Chiefs game last year if you haven't watched the turning point video that NFL Films puts out on that game it's fantastic you can find on Facebook find all over the internet NFL turning point watch that on that Chiefs Raiders game for you Raider fans you Chiefs fans look away <laughs> But um, but as far as in the division though, it's got to be the Chargers, and 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 I'm not saying this to pick on Kyle. Uh, you know, uh, respect. This is your show, and I'm a guest here, so I'm my my poking fun at the Chiefs. So oh, knows it's bound. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. I can. Well, they I suck. Can you're only win four games, so I'm not sweating yeah. your your, your team. Okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> but but uh, you know, I I seriously though, losing Alex Smith is going to be a big blow. Um, the Broncos took a major steps back. I don't buy into Case Keenum. I. They lost way too much on defense, and I think that Keenum is 
he's a nice story, but you know, nice stories typically don't have a way of working themselves out long term. Occasionally, you get a rich Gannon or whatever, but for the most part, those stories are, are relatively short lived. So, uh, I don't think they've got that situation figured out without a good quarterback. I'm certainly not afraid of you. Um, but the Chargers. So, even though the Chargers have lost Hunter Henry, uh, we know that he went down with a season-ending injury, uh, and that was certainly a, a, a big threat uh, in the, in the passing game. Um, but with that pass rush they have, when you're talking about Ingram and Bosa, like, man, that's deadly. Like, they are just crazy good on, on, when it comes to, to pass rush and really, frankly, their, their entire defense. And so I think that's going to be a threat because anytime you can play defense or run the football, right, and you got a savvy veteran quarterback, even though I think he's overrated and I can't stand watching him play. And, Kyle, I'm sure we can be uh, – the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like, I mean, that guy is just absolutely annoying to watch play football. But he's good, I guess. So, whatever. Um, but, yeah, so I think the Chargers are definitely going to be the, the, uh, the biggest threat to the Raiders. But it should be – and, Kyle, you'll disagree, and I would expect you to. But I, it should be the Raiders' division, Kevin. It's, it should be – I mean, we have, you know, one of – you know, I'm not going to say one of the best coaches of all time. We have a very capable, very good head coach, a great leader coming back to our organization. We have a franchise quarterback. We have an absolutely dominant pass rusher. Um, we have, you know, a great offensive line. Like when you start checking the boxes for all the things that you need for a team to be successful and to make a good playoff run, like we have all those boxes. Yes, there's questions. Yes, we need some help at linebacker. Yes, we need some help in the secondary. But these aren't like gaping, glaring holes. And if we hit on one or two of these players uh, that we've brought in uh, in the defense, our defense is going to be much, much improved over last year. We know our offense is going to be better based on the addition by subtraction with Michael Crabtree and bringing in a guy like Jordy Nelson. And, you know, we know that the, the, the chemistry is only going to get better with Derek Carr, Jared Cook. Like, uh, there's just so much good around the team that, the Raiders, frankly, should be much better than they were last year, and it's our division to take, and I fully expect them to, and the Chargers are going to be the only one that are going to be, you know, a threat to get in our way. Kyle, I want you to obviously uh, um, add a little rebuttal here, you being the uh, Chiefs fan, but I, I want to get your honest opinion on this and how you're feeling about your team and what Murph has said about the Raiders. Uh, what's interesting, though, about the schedule, the regular season schedule here, it's not till late in the second quarter here where in December 2nd, we're playing uh, at your Kansas city. It's a four Oh five Eastern game. And then we have, um, I'm sorry, that's, I'm sorry. That's at uh, Oakland. Uh, The one at Kansas city is the last game of the year. And that's a 1 PM game. What's your take on what Murph said and uh, how confident are you with your chiefs? You know, I, I look at Kansas City this way. This I do believe this is kind of a bit of a transition year going to Patrick Mahomes. You're going to a young quarterback who I think is incredibly talented, and I think he is going to have greatly benefited from basically sitting all last season, sitting behind Alex Smith and learning. And we were talking about a kid who, yeah, he was a number one pick, but there's been the whole stories about how humble he's been. This is a kid who actually turned down endorsement deals because he didn't feel it was his place to have them when he's not the starting quarterback of the team. I think if you're going to get Kansas city, you better get them early because as the season goes along and the more comfortable and, and the more improved Mahomes gets, that's not going to happen though. Uh, between our two teams, we're going to get you late in the season. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, and I would – now, hold on. And, and, Kyle, you know, look, listen, nobody, nobody's better coming off of a bye week and nobody's better at, at times than Andy Reid. But we also know that your team typically starts hot and then starts to die by the end of the year. And, you know, the fact that we have two of our last five games are against each other, like – I'd, I'd rather have that, frankly, based on the track record. I hear you on the on the rookie quarter or not rookie, but the young quarterback getting better as time goes on. But I'm not scared of Andy Reid. Like I, that, well, we yeah, know no, what I, the it is. Well, okay, but but uh, two. What I want to say though is, is Kansas City. The one thing Kansas City is set up for is their offense is going to be explosive. Who do you cover on that offense right now? Um, I I am a firm believer that if the biggest question for Sammy Watkins is obviously health. He went to the Rams very late in the, in the offseason last year. He never really got a chance to fully integrate into that offense. And if anybody improves quarterbacks and wide receivers, it's Andy Reid. Andy Reid has done miracle, miracle. I mean, look what he did developing Donovan McNabb. Look what Toronto's had his best career year with the Eagles. 
I think he can get Sammy Watkins turned around. Spencer Ware is coming back into the fold to give Kareem Hunt a little bit of a, a breather as well. The, the offensive line is going to be solid. Our, our, the defense is our question. I, I actually think it's addition by subscription by subtraction of getting rid of Marcus Peters for as talented as he was this guy was way too much of a headache and there were times where he cost us games getting just stupid penalties I mean even the Raiders game the Raiders yeah. game oh yeah um I think they, I think a lot of people are going to be surprised by Kendall Fuller who they picked up in the Alex Smith trade and I think there's a couple of their defensive rookies who are going to be better and let's remember too they're getting a healthy D4 back this year which is going to tremendously help their pass rush so you have if you have Houston and Ford on the outside providing pass rush, they're still going to be plenty scary. But realistically, I know it's it's a probably a transition year. I think they're still in the mix for the division. Um, I think the only team to me that's really out of the division race is Denver. And I'm like with Murph, I'm not sold on Case Keenum. That just screams one year wonder to me. Denver's going to have a phenomenal defense, especially throwing Bradley Chubb into that mix. But their offense is just going to be a mess. Um, I think the Chargers are the most talented team in the division. I think it's not even close there, but they're the Chargers until they actually do something and prove it. <laughs> I, I'm glad you said that, Kyle, because I, I have been saying that for years. And how many games did they lose by like two or three points this last year? They just could not seem to find a way to close out a game when they had the momentum to win the game. Well, it, just, it just seems like there is some type of Chargers curse when it comes to that to where you just said – I'm going to believe it when I see it. Well, but here's the thing, and this is what, one of the reasons why I'm actually leaning, as much as it kills me to say it, I'm leaning as the Chargers to be the favorite for the division. They started turning it around in the second half of the season, and I really do like their head coach, Anthony Lynn. This guy is a class act, and he knows his football. Now, as far as the Raiders go, they do the, the opposite of your guy, of you guys. They're always the ones that start off 0 and 4. And then they friggin' finish. You know what I'm saying? Like they'll, they'll yeah. be the winning round. But you guys do the opposite. You guys start off strong and then you finish with, and it's like, you know what I mean? I, I yeah, I, I fully expect that to happen again. Now, as far as the Raiders go, they should be improved. There was, there was, they were a disappointing team last year. There was too much talent there to play the way they played last year. I do have a couple of questions that I want to ask you guys, and I'm going to ask you guys to turn off, really take, try to take off your Raiders blinders for a minute, because <laughs> I experienced. The John Gruden I Tampa Bay. I can't see. I took him off. I can't see, man. I, <laughs> man, I can't see nothing. I, I experienced one prism yeah. to look through, Kyle. I, I experienced the last, I experienced the John Gruden air here in Tampa, and one of the things, and I see it happening with the Raiders, is John Gruden loves older veterans, and sometimes he loves them a little too much, and. You know, I understand it was it's additions by subtraction, getting Crabtree out of the locker room. But the question is, like, how much does Jordy Nelson have in the tank? Um, I don't understand the Doug Martin signing at all. I, you're just trying to go for depth, but that guy is again. I, I know for him from here and being living here in Tampa, and he is a mess. Um, but you guys do have the talent, and I think it's a three team race for this division. It, it's just the, the other thing I'm going to, and I'm, this is where I'm going to ask you guys as far as Gruden goes. I mean, I know Raiders Nation is excited. I know he's a good football coach. He's kind of staying in it with Monday Night Football and the broadcasting and everything, but there's still a big difference from being up in the booth to being on the sidelines. And there are, there's already a lot of talk. He's already thrown analytics out the window, everything that the NF, modern NFL is doing, and he's trying to go with an old back to old school football, bringing in the fullback, things like that. Do you think it's going to take him a season to get acclimated to the NFL game that is being played today compared from the last time he coached? Murph, to I, yeah, Murph, you take this one here because he, he he has a point to where he's skeptical about what, you know, and there's some Raider fans that are feeling about what Gruden could do too. We're seeing some nice signs during the, uh, the OTAs here and stuff in the mini camps, but um, he's, Kyle's got some points here. What do you think? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a narrative certainly. Um, and it's not without cause because yeah, he's signed a lot of, of aging free agents, but I think the thing that's key here though, is that most of the team is young and you're talking about transient positions, essentially or transition positions because they're, they're there's not a long-term fix that's already in place. So why not bring players in? that can help with the terminology, that can help with the schemes, that can help with these things to try to essentially mentor to the younger players to try to install 
quicker. You know, John Gruden gets criticized for being an old school guy, but he's also pretty savvy and he's savvy in the fact that he knows he's limited now versus what he used to be. So when you bring in guys like Derek Johnson or you bring in guys like Leon Hall, you bring in these, these guys, they're able to take those, that knowledge base and then be able to give that to the younger guys. You got a guy like Jordy Nelson. There is not a better mentor possible to mentor a young receiver like Amari Cooper. Like, if you would have given me in the offseason, like, you get to pick any wide receiver in the league to go and mentor, like, that's the guy. You want the guy with the work ethic, the guy with the good hands, the guy that's got to focus on route running. Like, all the things that that uh, Amari Cooper needs to work on, that's what they brought. So, if, if that helps the learning curve and shorten the learning curve by having these veterans, I don't look at that as a knock because these are positions we're going to have to replace anyways. You, like you mentioned, Doug Martin, all right, you bring him in, he, he, he backs up Marshawn Lynch. We were, I'm surprised we didn't draft a running back already. We're going to have to get a running back at some point, so why not bring in somebody to kind of fill the role until they find a, a, a more permanent position? Because when you look at the core of the team, when you look at our quarterbacks, when you look at our line, when you look at our uh, the, the players that are going to be Raiders for a long, long time, those are all the key players, all the key positions. And so they're all young. So the, the older guys, it's, it's, it's not that big of a deal. It's, it sounds like a big deal because of it seems like it was a lot at the turnover. But when you look at the positions that were turned over, there really weren't. You know, when you, I mean, you're talking about our number one corner, our cor- franchise quarterback, our pass rusher, our, you know, our, our, our line. I mean, those guys are all young. They're all sub 30 years old. So I'm not, I'm not worried about it at all. So I, I like what you're saying. He, he's working on um, getting some assistance with seasoned players to help the younger ones because the one thing that I kind of felt last year and it was one of the problems that divided the team was it didn't seem like there was anyone helping anyone. It, you know, something happened, maybe it was with Crabtree or something, and, and the locker room was starting to get poisoned after that Washington loss. And so I, I think that uh, with what Gruden is trying to do is that he's always done well with, you know, mixing the, um, the veterans with the younger guys and getting them to work well together. I see Doug Martin maybe a one and done. What do you think? Murph. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think, and I think Marshawn's done. I don't think Marshawn's going to Vegas. I mean, he's, plus he's going at 32. I mean, like, you know, that's, that's when running backs tend to fall off a cliff and, you know, in, in terms of production. So yeah, I think Martin's definitely going to be a short term fix. He's the guy that's going to run the ball between the twenties, most likely. And uh, you know, and then that's, that's going to be it. And you know, the, the, the thing about John too, and something that I really want to want to want to key in on is that we had Pete Koch who was, who played for the Raiders uh, back in the eighties. He was also big Swede, in the movie heartbreak Ridge. If you ever oh, seen. That was a great interview you guys did. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. He was, he was great. And, you know, one of the things that we talked to him about, and, and he gave testimony to this firsthand, was that your head coach is your leader. Like, your head coach, it, it, we as, uh, sometimes as fans, we, we get caught up in the idea of, well, what's this coach going to do, you know, scheme is, is the game of football past John Gruden by, right? Like, that's kind of the popular thing to, to – yep to think aloud or, or to discuss the answer to that question is no because he's a leader of men and that's what your coach does your co- yes is john gruden going to introduce things schematically and a, a type of football they're going to run yes but he's not drawn up x's and o's in the dirt like that's going to be left up to greg olson that's going to be left up to rich basakia that's going to be left up to uh, to paul gunther those are the guys that are going to actually do the schemes and the installs and the coaching those guys are coaching John Gruden is going to lead this organization. And the thing that killed us last year was that we had no leadership. Jack Del Rio is a good schematic guy and he is a good X's and O's guys. And he sucks as a leader of men. And so when there was division in the locker room, it festered and it turned into a big giant cluster F. And that was because nobody was there to manage it. There was nobody that had the, the leadership qualities to manage it. And now Gruden has them. And then he will impart that on guys like Derek Carr, Derek Carr, you'll see, will start to hold players more accountable. Khalil Mack will start to hold players more accountable. And you're going to have this new attitude and this new overall presence of the Raiders carrying us in. And this just turned into Raiders end zone radio. And I love it. And, <laughs> but, uh, this, I'm telling you guys, it's, it's, we are going to see a different shift. We're going to see a paradigm shift in the Oakland Raiders organization with John Gruden's arrival. And it has nothing to do with his X's and O's. It has everything to do with his leadership. What, one, one thing, Kyle, uh, what I wanted to talk to you about was the rivalry between the Raiders and the Chiefs here. 
one thing that I've always respected about this rivalry is there, there seems to be a certain respect among the players and the history between each other and even the fans. I know several of my Raider fans that love to go to Kansas City to see these games. And it's not just because there is a, a good fan base there, but there's something about the fans there themselves. And I thought that I'd like you to touch on being a fan of the Chiefs and whenever, you know, before even I met you, whenever the Raiders were coming to town, you would watch those games. Uh, no matter what the record were, it always seemed like, you know, it was you, you never hardly got a lot of blowouts, but you got some really good fought games. Yeah. It's throughout history. I mean, there's always been there's blowouts here and there, but basically throughout history, when it comes to Chiefs Raiders, you throw it all out the window. You throw the records out, you throw everything out because they get hyped up for each other and they play hard against each other. And they're, they're, I mean, I don't want to say there's bad blood there, but there's very competitive blood. I think all the bad blood is both the Chiefs and Raiders. If they had their brothers would rather beat up on the Broncos than each other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but the, but the thing, but, but the thing with it is, especially in the, what I've noticed kind of in the, when I, I'm going to say within the last 20 years of Raiders Chiefs is it's been very streaky. The Raiders went on a pretty good streak of beating the Chiefs for a while, and now it's been the Chiefs kind of be beating the Raiders. And I think that's going to start leveling off here because I think, truthfully, both teams are young enough to where they're going and have youth at all the at their key positions that it's going to grow where they're, these two teams are going to be battling out for a while. I think San Diego right now might still be the best, complete, most complete team in the division, but Phillip Rivers is on the back end. Denver is a quarterback disaster area right now. And I think, you know, with Carr and you look at Mahomes, I think the two best quarterbacks, young quarterbacks, in that, and maybe even in the AFC are right there um, throwing Deshaun Watson from the Texans if he's healthy. But one of the things, too, that you know, and you talk about, Kevin, is they do have a, there is a respect there for each other because they know how hard they compete against each other. And you know what? And I still say to this day, and Murph, I'm, I think you'll agree with me on this, the Chiefs-Raiders rivalry really took a turn when Marcus Allen went to Kansas City. Oh yeah, yeah. I I I fully agree with that. I, even past all the the old school, because that's an old school rivalry, right? And you know, and and outside of Bears Packers, like I'm not sure that there's a better one. Like I I think that you know, and I think they can fairly lay claim to the best rivalry in the NFL. Maybe Cowboys Niners is fixed in there, but other than that, I think it's Raiders Chiefs, man, for sure. And then it's a deep seated one. And absolutely, when Marcus went over, and it didn't it feel like to you, and I don't know, I don't have it in front of me, but it. <laughs> felt like that was the beginning of players that you talk about the incest division that was kind of the first big name to drop and then all of a sudden it was albert lewis and it was like all yeah. these other players started going and moving in between the teams and it was like wow okay you know, <laughs> but the Derek johnson like it's still going yeah. on yeah um but i mean I, and what was funny though is i remember when alan signed with the chiefs and a lot of my friends who were Raiders fans all kind of came to me and said, thank you for keeping this guy in the league. He deserved this shot because of what had happened with Al and Al kind of putting him in the doghouse and not even letting him on the field. So I think actually when the Chiefs signed Marcus Allen, I mean, as much as it killed the Raiders fans to see him in a Kansas City uniform, they were actually thankful and respectful for the Chiefs for giving Marcus a, a, a legitimate shot to finish out his career properly. Uh, no, he's dead to me. <laughs> 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 you got Didn't, some. You got some I know it, it, that was that was painful to watch. Ooh. Yeah, that was a hard one. I, I get where you're going with that, and those are some very nice folks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now Kevin, I do, I do, I, I do, I do have one more as far as Chiefs Raiders go because I know when we had our last episode, we talked a lot about the rookies and the, the, the draft picks and free agent signings. Uh, for me, I can't. I know Kansas City put drafted heavy on rookies. They have a couple of defensive rookies who I think are going to be key contributors this year. Um, I think Sammy Watkins is going to finally find his career in Kansas City. He's not under the pressure to be the number one receiver when you have Kelsey and Tyree Kill there. But I want to ask Murph since he's here, who do you who do you like out of your draft to make an impact? Because I know the Raiders, especially in the later rounds, drafted a couple of guys that were. One has a big medical question, and I hope he pans out for that guy's sake because this is a good kid, but it's a pretty serious medical condition. And then you also had the kid from LSU who's kind of got a questionable background, and you guys made a few free agent signs. Who, who do you there do you think is going to be your impact out of, out of the draft and free agents this year? 
Yeah, those. so the two you're referring to is uh, Arden Key out of LSU, uh, pass rusher, edge rusher, uh, and then uh, Maurice Hurst out of, University, out of Michigan, uh, defensive tackle. I think that if, if the Raiders hit on either of those two, uh, man, you are uh, in for a long day with, uh, with Patrick Mahomes, man, because they are – we're going to be able to get after the quarterback. I mean, we already know what uh, Khalil Mack can do. And then with a, uh, a reassigned Bruce Irvin to strictly be a pass rusher, uh, our bookends are, are set. And then plus, uh, you know, with, with, the, with the presence in the middle with Jelly Ellis and then hopefully now with, with Hurst and Key. Uh, so a couple things there. So uh, Arden Key, I think, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, he had uh, substance abuse issues, checked himself into rehab for marijuana, which uh, my co-host, Sonny, is a drug and alcohol addictions counselor, and he's very well versed on, on, uh, on uh, you know, substance abuse and whatnot. And he, even he says that, like, you don't really check yourself into – rehab for addiction like it's not really it's more of a mental addiction it's not a physical addiction so the fact that he um did that probably was a little bit misrepresented uh clearly he was i think trying to send a message and granted the guy is trying to straighten his life out and that's the greater point and to be celebrated he sonny was just wondering how genuine it really was and i think that that's why arden key falls and isn't a first round pick so i think that that was a fair assessment on it now that said if he turns out to be alden smith well then no harm no foul we drafted him late enough but if he hits whoa like look out the kid's absolutely talented um so and then with maurice hurst uh it, it was a heart condition uh, they called it a condition but really it's a a blip that showed up on an ekg very similar to what happened to star low to lele and star low to lele as we know now is one of the more de- dominant defensive tackles in the league and just as a personal reference i had this happen to me one time it happened my, before my 40th birthday um it it, it uh, I, I went in for a physical and i had something come up on an ekg and they had to do all these tests and had to investigate look all the, at the end of the day everything was fine and i'm perfectly healthy but it was this thing that came up it's the same thing and out of an abundance of caution they send the players through all these tests, and so it sends up an alarm. Well, the Raiders are the benefiters of this. I mean, this guy is an absolute monster player. I don't know how much University of Michigan football you watched. Um, I didn't watch a ton, but I did watch the All or Nothing uh, miniseries that's on Amazon Prime, and ab- he is a rock star, man. This guy is an absolute stud. And so with these two players that we've taken flyers on, if we can generate the kind of pass rush that I think we're going to be able to generate in, a, in addition to what we already have, whew, look out, man. I'm telling you, we're going to be putting some quarterbacks on their cool over this year. <laughs> um, before we wind down this episode, I just want to touch one more thing on the Raiders-Chiefs thing. And the big question and the big scenario that is always in the back of my head is W-I-T-K, where is Travis Kelsey? <laughs> <laughs> this is the player that's always annoyed the hell out of me because I respect the hell out of him. He may not get a ton of touchdowns, but he always gets those clutch first downs, and it pisses me off. <laughs> right, Murph? I mean, come on. You, we- <laughs> oh, I couldn't agree with you more. Travis Kelsey is one of those guys that, despite uh, my absolute uh, uh, all my attempts, I can't hate on him. Like I, I, I really don't want to like him. It was kind of like I used to feel about like Steve Young, and there's like a handful of players. Where I'm like, I really don't want to like you, but he's a nice guy. He, you know what I mean? He represents himself well. He's funny. He's a good personality, and he's an amazing football player. Like, I, I can't hate on him at all. I don't like him, and I think the uniform he wears is stupid. But, <laughs> but, but you know, but he's a heck of a football player. And, in, and I'll tell you what, if we don't get it figured out, whether that's some sort of a linebacker that can potentially cover him or get Obi Melifonwu up to speed to where, which is what we drafted him for, was to cover – Travis Kelsey and Hunter Henry and Rob Gronkowski and all these athletic. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's why we drafted him. So if he if we can't get it together and figure it out, we're going to be in for a long day when it comes because what is the, what is the number one safety valve for any quarterback, but especially a young one, is a tight end that can get open and catch the football. Right, Kyle? So, I mean. Yeah, Kyle, t- t- a touch on that. I assume that Kelsey's working very closely with Mahomes right now. Um. Yeah, actually, one of the big things has been – the minute Alex Smith got traded, Patrick Mahomes called every Chiefs wide receiver on the roster, and he's had several off-site passing camps, and they have all been working with him. And you got to remember, Travis, uh, Travis Kelsey especially has said this, but 
Patrick Mahomes earned the respect of the state chief starters with the way he played in that final game against the Denver Broncos at the end of the season, bringing them back on that final drive for the game winning field goal. They are very high on this kid and they have a lot of respect for this kid about the way he handled himself in his rookie year, how respectful he was to Alex Smith. This wasn't a guy who went in and tried to com- campaign for the job. He was a, came in with this cocky, I'm a number one pick attitude. He just came in there and worked his butt off and just made an impression <laughs> So he's he he's he's coming into a good situation. I want to ask you guys too about one last thing with the Raiders. As far as Derek Carr is concerned, because I, I think he's a, I think he's got all the talent in the world. And Kevin and I talked about this several times last season. Derek Carr's biggest problem is he tries to do everything and put it all on his own shoulders. And I know Kevin, it was very frustrating for you at times last season. Yeah, it was uh, because he kind of had to because he was kind of seeing the chinks in the armor and what was happening to the team and and, and trying to see what's going on. And, and I know you've touched on this, uh, uh, Murph. Um, do, you, do you see him kind of uh, stepping back from that or do you think he's that type of player that he has to kind of make plays happen if things fall short? Um, well, are we, uh, you know, there's, I think there's a couple of different ways to address that, right? So there's the, the mentality of, I have to do everything myself. And then there's the physical play of that. I have to take over and do everything myself. Um, Derek Carr is a Brett Favre fan. That's why he wears number four. Nobody manufactured plays better, maybe in the history of the NFL than Brett Favre. Now, not always to the benefit of the team, sometimes to his own detriment, but he was all about creating and thought he could make every single play ever. He thought he could fit every pass through every window ever. And so there is an element of Derek Carr um, that does that, that feels like he can do everything. Now, I think that the more talent has been built around him, um, the more... Uh, open he has been to distributing the football. You don't see him run as much as he used to, as an example. You see, uh, we last year, if Kevin, if we saw one check down, we saw 849,000 check downs. Like he was constantly dumping the ball off sooner than later, you know, instead of waiting for things to develop downfield, didn't want to force it. He was almost overcautious. So I think with Gruden, his influence coming in, it will open Derek Carr up to that uh, physically. So it's on play, but then also the mental aspect of it. Every Derek Carr owned every single thing that ever happened to the Raiders from 1962 until 2018. Like he was like, put it all on my shoulders. It's all on me. It's all on me. It's all on me. I love that about you, Derek, and I'm love that you're humble enough and you're enough of a leader. <laughs> I know where you're going with this, yes. But the whole planet is not your fault. Like it's okay to hold other people accountable. Now, do you want to be a you know a red A running off the field like Philip Rivers and screaming and hooting and hollering or like Dan Marino and like no, I don't want to get up in front of people in people's face and screaming and all that. But it's, but it is okay to allow for those players to stand on their own accord. You don't yeah, have to yeah. responsibility for everything. Like, let them handle them. You don't have to own it all, Derek. So, I think there's I, a I, kind of that, both. That, I'm wondering if we're going to see a change of his maturity with that because I was getting tired of him putting it all on him when we knew that it wasn't. You know, you knew and that it wasn't. Yeah. yeah, that that was very, very it's almost deceitful the other way. It's like, come on, dude. Like, look, I love what you're doing, but don't like you're not you're blowing smoke here. Like we get like, come on, we got eyes too. I got eyes. I saw what happened. I saw who <laughs> yes. receivers drop seven passes for first downs. Like, you don't have to own that. That's not your fault. Okay, okay. I got Wait. I got I got one last question here and I want you to address this one too, Kyle. Okay. When um when we look at this schedule here uh for the Raiders, of course we're you know, we're hitting your Kansas City Chiefs late in the season. Uh we're hitting uh Denver sort of, you know, at the beginning and at the end and we're hitting the Chargers kind of around the middle of the season. But I want to ask you this. It, when I look at the schedule, it, it's not a favorable schedule, but I think it's a good schedule. It's not this heavy schedule that we had last year. I, I think it's going to be very competitive. We're playing, um, you know, playing the, obviously the Pittsburgh and, and, and uh, Cleveland and um, Baltimore and that, that, that division. But I want to talk about that first game. The first game at home against the Rams. Is this – you know how there's the cliche of this is a statement game. Is this a statement game right out of the bat? And how big is this game? And if we don't win this game as a Raiders fan, is that going to 
is that going to be – are we going to be looking over our shoulder because of that? Are we going to be playing catch-up to the other teams? Um, Kyle, I want to start with you, and then Murph, I want you to answer that afterwards. Okay. Okay, first of all, let's not forget all the pressure Derek Carr is going to have on him because of the other quarterback in the Bay Area who's never going to lose a football game for as long as he lives. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy GQ, okay. Jimmy GQ will be the shadow over the Bay Area until the Raiders move to Vegas and then become the Golden Rollers or something like that. But, uh, no, I think, it, I, think it's, I think the Raiders have to go out and at least be competitive with the Rams. I I. I the Rams are going to come out looking to make a huge statement themselves to show that last year wasn't a fluke and that we're here to say, if Aaron Donald is on that team and you got Aaron Donald and Dominican Sue up front, it's going to be a long day for quarterbacks throughout the NFL. Um, if Tlaib and Marcus Peter, Peters can keep their sanity even halfway in check, they're, they're going to be hard to pass on. I mean, that's two shutdown corners. that Very few teams have that. But the Rams are a lot of what-ifs, in my opinion. However, I think for the Raiders, and I think it's, I think it's actually going to be something for, the, for not only the players, but for Gruden as well. They've got to go out and they've got to make a strong showing. If they should go out and for whatever reason, the Rams just blow them out of the water, and I don't foresee that happening, but it's the NFL. You never know what's going to happen week to week. It could have a devastating effect on the Raiders' psyche to kick off the season. And it could even have Gruden questioning himself a little bit. And I know – I would think as Raiders fans, a lot of you might be saying, okay, maybe we didn't make the right decision with Gruden because we're that fast to react as um, a yeah. society, with, especially in social media days. So I think the Raiders have to come out there. They have to be com- at least competitive and keep it close with the Ra- Rams. If, if, and if they should win, then a lot of people are going to be raving, the Raiders are back, Gruden's taking us to the Super Bowl. <laughs> Murph, what's your take on that? Well, first, first game. Uh, you guys need to take Tuesday off of work because it's a 1020 East Coast start time. Yes, it is. Wow. <laughs> you guys are up to the middle of the night watching the Raiders. Um, okay, so, and we know you're going to watch, Kyle. We know you're going to watch. Uh, oh, it's football. <laughs> I'm going to watch. You know, you're you're, you're rude for Derek a little bit in there, too. You know. Okay, so oh, I have nothing but love for Derek Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. Um, okay, so, uh, but here's. <laughs> Is it important? Yeah, I think that to use a, a, my favorite new uh, corporate term nowadays, the optics of this football game. Um, the, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what a concept using the term optics when it turns on watching football on TV. So, you know, yes, it's got to look good for our football team um, because the, the Rams are the hot team this year, right? We know what the Rams did last year. Uh, they've done nothing but add a, a lot of talent to their, to their football team. They are going to be the popular choice, uh, one of the popular choices in the NFC, certainly in that division. Um, so they're the, you know, the young up-and-coming team, and you could even say that you know, Sean McVay is like what the Gruden was you know, in 1998. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's very similar there. Uh, the NFL is not – they're not dummies. They're a multi-billion dollar organization for a reason, and that reason is ratings, and they put John Gruden back on Monday Night Football in week one. <laughs> yes, they did. Like, the world is going to be watching even at 10.20 p.m. East Coast time. You know, there's going to be a lot of eyeballs on this. So if there is a such thing as a must-win or statement game week one, yeah. And the, all the pressure, frankly, is on the Raiders. You know, the, do the Rams need this game? It's an it's a, it's a, out-of-conference game on the road. How big of a deal is it to the Rams if they lose? It's not. And in terms of, you know, total um, impact to the season, very little. How big of an impact is it to the Raiders from a standings perspective? Same as the Rams. But again, to use that word, the optics of it, though, the Raiders got to play good. And they frankly, they probably need to win because no matter what, even if they lose by one in overtime, the criticism is going to come out. Oh, is football passed him by. Oh, is John Gruden this? John, all the all it's going to do is flame any of those little bits of criticism. Where if if the Raiders come out and they win this game, it squashes it. It goes to bed, and they're not going to be on ESPN and again until Christmas Eve. So, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. so it, it's it's kind of a big deal. I think it's kind of a big deal. Kyle, I want to start adopting the term optics for the Fandom Podcast Network. Can we do that? Yeah, we are the official home of Optics. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well said, Murph. Oh, man, it's been good to have you back on here talking football. Even if it's, 
yeah, of, of course, Raiders football, but just football in general. Yeah, I know we're I know we're all excited for our teams hey, and Kevin. Yeah. Before we before we let Murph go though, do you mind if I play a little speed round with him? Sure, go for it. Uh-oh. Okay, Murph. All right. We're, What's we're, we're gonna be done. This is just general across the NFL, real oh, okay. quick. Okay, okay, okay. Comeback player of the year. Who's going to be coming back from injury or down season? Uh, Odell Beckham Jr. Okay. Uh, rookie of the year. Uh, Josh Allen. Okay. I, that's a reach, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> surprise. Well, big Sam Garnold, then I think it's going to be one of the quarterbacks. Uh, surprise team of the year. Ooh. Uh, can I. Well, I know who I want to pick, but they beat your Chiefs in the playoffs last year, so how surprising are they? But I'm going to say the Tennessee Titans. Okay. Um, team that's going to disappoint? Uh, uh, the Minnesota Vikings. Interesting. Biggest free agent signing. Guy who's, guy who's went changed teams is going to have a huge year. Jordy Nelson. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have a feeling I know what this biggest free agent bust, and I think I know what your answer is going to be. A biggest free agent bust, uh, Case Keenum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, that's gotta be yeah. Case. I think he's going to be a one-year wonder. Okay, and will the Cleveland Browns win a football game? Yes, I think the Browns are going to be good. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> they to them going to the playoffs, or well, maybe the playoffs. I don't know. We'll see. But I think they got. Look, you got way too much talent there. We didn't even talk about like Jarvis Landry tonight. Like that dude's legit, man. And like they're going to talk about weapons. And I don't think this. What I don't understand is this whole thing about uh, Baker Mayfield. Like how he's not going to start. Like, come on, man. Drafted a quarterback in the first round. He's going to start at some point. <laughs> Uh, he will at some point. I don't think he's going to start for them with the season. I think that's. I think they're going to. I think Hugh Jackson can't afford to throw Baker Mayfield to the wolves right out of the gate. Um, well, okay. Lastly, first coach to get fired. Ooh. Oh, uh, golly. Let's see. Let me think for a minute. Um, first. That's a, t- that's a tough one. Golly, yeah, that's a brutal question. I'm trying to think of the. T- Let's see who's going to. Uh, Marvin Lewis. I think he's overstayed his welcome. Uh, I think that he's been, you know, I think is he the longest tenured coach at this point? Maybe him and Belichick, and I mean, is he's on the short list, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and I, I'm kind of surprised he made it through last year. You know, like that. The, they, I mean, talk about constantly underachieving. Um, what do they got to look forward to this year? John Ross coming back from injury. Like, I mean, the Bengals really don't. I, I don't know. I, I think that it's got to be uh, Marvin Lewis. What they're looking okay. forward to is the Raiders visiting. <laughs> yeah. okay. oh, right. That's going to be fun. It's the jungle, baby. That's right. <laughs> Last one. If All right. Everybody, if everybody on the team is healthy, the team that scares you the most. If everyone is healthy, the team that scares me is a Raider fan or just thinks – I just think that they're going to do well? Give me both. As a Raider fan and that you think is going to do well. Uh, well, your Chiefs scare me, even more so than what the, um, than, than what the Chargers do. Be, you know, and the, and the reason why is that because I think there's just one too many threats offensively for the Chiefs. Like, you can't cover everybody. Like, someone's going to get open – and considering that we have coverage questions to begin with, the Chiefs kind of scare me in that. Like, I know what Jamal Charles used to do to us, right? I know what Tyreek Hill has done to us. Like, I know what some of these players have done. And those electrifying type players like that, if you don't get them covered and challenge them with the line of scrimmage, they will tear us up. And so, as a Raider fan, uh, I'm, 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 that, that's kind of scary to me. Um, as far as barring injuries, the one that was scary, I, I, I just, it may sound a little easy, but – the Patriots, man. Like, every time you think they're done, they win a Super Bowl. Like, I mean, every time, you know what I mean? Like, and, and this year, they should be done. Like, they, there's no reason, um, or very few other than Tom Brady and Bill Belichick and Rob Gronkowski, but, like, you know, get, losing Nate Solder, you know, he goes off to, uh, to New York to go protect Eli's blind side. Like, you know, you look at the things that have kind of stacked up against him. I know we traded him Cordero Patterson and – you know, they made, but they lost Deion Lewis. Like they lost Malcolm Butler. Like they should be vulnerable this year, but don't you know it? The AFC East is going to stink. And, you know, if either one of our teams makes the playoffs, guess who we're going to play? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? Nah. They're find their way in. 
I got a team that scares me and I think could be if everybody's healthy is really scary and that's the Houston Texans because the way they were going with Deshaun Watson last year before he got hurt they were the best team in the league yeah hey, and then you had Tyron Matthew to that secondary man there were if their defense wasn't already good to begin with you're right hey and that's a, that's a very that's I'm excited I live outside of Nashville and I'm I, I like the Titans. Not save, save your emails, Raider fans. I'm a Raider fan, but I do. It's the local team down the road, and we get a chance to see them play. And I I like to support them when they're not competing with the Raiders. Um, but man, that, so I get to see a lot of AFC South stuff around here, and the, the Colts are gonna stink. But man, the other three teams, holy cow, that's gonna be a bloodbath, man. Like that's those are gonna be some fun fo- as a football fan, not as a Raider fan, but as an NFL junkie, those games are gonna be exciting, man. Watching the yeah. Texans, Titans, and Jaguars all beat each other up. Wow, those are gonna. I mean, physical. All play great. <laughs> Look at the Titans, man, put uh, they they're they're starting secondary now. You're gonna have Malcolm Butler, uh, Adoree Jackson, and Logan Ryan, plus Kevin Byard from MTSU represent right here, in Middle Tennessee. <laughs> Kevin Byard back there, who was one of the leading uh, uh, interceptors last year in the league. I mean. Dude, like they, those teams are defense all over the place, man. It's going to be crazy in the AFC South this year. I'm stoked to watch I, it. I have one thing to say about that. Okay. Mike Vrabel set Marcus Mariota free. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Uh, I, first of all, thank you for uh, coming on here, Murph. And uh, I want to get your final thoughts and stuff. But uh, I want to I, I uh, let the listeners know where they can find the Fandom Podcast Network before we close out here. Uh, you can find all of our shows in the Fandom Podcast Network at fpnet.podbean.com. Also, uh, you can find it on the Podbean app. Fandom Podcast Network is on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, and Google Play. Please check us out on Facebook under Fandom Podcast Network. You can also email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com and on Instagram at Fandom Podcast Network and also on Twitter at Fanpod Network. I'm Kevin. I am on Twitter and Spartan underscore Phoenix. Kyle, where can we find you? You can find me on Twitter at a Kyle W or AKA chiefs win the super bowl, or you can find me on Instagram at a Kyle fandom. Patrick Mahomes sets NFL passing records. <laughs> oh, dream. You can dream Murph. I want to thank you for coming on and please, before you sign out here, let us know where our fans can find you Raiders fan radio, right? Raiders Fan Radio, you can Google it and find us all over the place, RaidersFanRadio.com. Uh, we are at Raiders Fan Radio on Twitter. You can find us at Raiders Fan Radio Podcast on Facebook. We are at iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, anywhere you can find a podcast, you can find us. So definitely check us out. Uh, and if you want to hit me up directly, it's uh, at underscore Murph, M-U-R-F. And, and yeah, well, Kevin, just real quick, I want to apologize um, and just let Murph know I have no idea where all those arrowheads ended up in your server shutting you down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I love the friendly sabotage, Kyle. <laughs> Uh, I want to remind the listeners, uh, stay tuned at the end of the show. We've got a great new promo uh, letting you know of all the great shows on the uh, Fandom Podcast Network. Uh, Before we head on out of here, Murph, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for coming on the Hair Metal Podcast earlier. That episode is going to be out later. Uh, It was fun to talk about something other than football and something else that we share. And it was also great to talk to you about football again, man. Yeah, man. Thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate you inviting me here. I had a great time. I I love all your shows. I was telling uh, Kevin, Kyle, before you got on, I love all your shows, but I can't listen to them all because you guys do so many. I don't have that many hours in the day. Plus, I'm trying to do my own podcast. Um, But yeah, everything I've ever heard you guys do, of course, I never miss the end zone. I always catch that. But uh, all the stuff you guys do is fantastic. And uh, uh, I'm very thankful that you and I'm humbled that you would ask me to be a part of it. And uh, look forward to doing more, man. Anytime you you want me and I'm available, let's uh, link our schedules up as I have have a great time with you all. And I appreciate you again for having me. Kyle, Kyle, final words. Um, Bring on the NFL season. Training camp, we got OTAs right now. We're about a month away or so from the early training camps opening. Uh, first preseason games in beginning of August. Bring it on. Uh, I, let's get through this summer heat and bring on some NFL. Yes, definitely. Again, on behalf of our special guest, Murph from Raiders Fan Radio, thank you, sir, for coming on. Kyle, thank you for coming on last minute. I'm glad you uh, got the electricity back. It's always good to talk football with you. Uh, please stay tuned for more of the end zone. We're going to 
probably do a little like, you know, I guess a little preseason thing, talk about some fantasy football as well. And of course, during the regular season, make sure you check us out on our weekly show as we talk about the NFL. And uh, I'm going to be uh, coming on Raiders Fan Radio again. Yeah. Most definitely, yes. <laughs> Anyway, thank you guys for listening and join us again next time here on The End Zone on the Fandom Podcast Network.